Uh, this is Jerry Barrett talking again. Uh, today's date is uh, May 15, 1986. I'm continuing an interview with uh, Jack Johnson uh, at uh, Eastern Airline headquarters in Miami. Uh, Jack, could, could you talk a little bit about the, uh, the role that uh, uh, let's see, Callah uh, Bob Callahan and, uh, and Charlie Bryant played no, the problems that might be created by them being also on the board of directors as yeah. well as being people with whom you negotiate? Uh, Jerry, that depends on the, on the, I think a lot on the maturity and the security and the general sense of self-esteem and, and of the union leaders themselves and also um, how they how they view that relationship is an overall a thought I mean if you just say a question from a corporate viewpoint to what extent uh, did their membership on the board cause us problems from a business standpoint I think probably overall not all that much I'm, I'm saying that I don't I don't think there are too many examples if any of them well in the, in the end maybe but during the course of this and during what I would call normal operations and normal activities I don't think there are too many examples of them breaching the confidence of a board member or going public with some sensitive information that otherwise not, would not be made available to the public nor would in general be the public's business um, as far as how that affected our relationship in dealing with them, there was, there really, in dealing with Charlie Bryan and the machinists, there really was no evidence that, that um, he viewed himself uh, differently as a labor negotiator and as a, um, uh, as a union president that 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 took on a different tone once he was a board member once he became a board member so so he and i think it's it's the nature of his personality that he's able to separate and com and put in separate compartments those those uh two responsibilities he's very proud of that fact and so i can't ever recall him saying to me in a bargaining setting or in a in a dispute setting, whether it's bargaining or uh, grievance resolution or contract interpretation problems, ever once saying uh, or making reference to his board membership and the rights and privileges that went with that, and those, and then superseding uh, any authority or or overriding any authority I have. So he's never called on that. To say, uh, in this, in that, those settings, in the standard labor management relations settings, he's never used that to his advantage. Um, his knowledge of the operation, of course, was um, could have been different than mine or other other people dealing in labor relations, but I think because it had been our practice up until the near the near the end, and when I say that, near the time that we were uh, in most difficulty, near the time when we were really trying to gain additional concessions to avoid default and to place us in a profitable position. It had been the practice up to that time that I would attend board meetings as well and would almost always make a labor relations presentation or at least at the beginning of the meeting do a labor update as would the operational people and others. So th it never really presented a problem from both the standpoint that he had greater knowledge and information, nor from the standpoint that he viewed that as a uh, superior position. Callahan, on the other hand, is directly opposite from that. Callahan had, uh, I think, used the the board seat as a 
point of uh, and a position of personal privilege. I remember his very first uh, board meeting in New York uh, where he uh, delayed arriving uh, on three different occasions, so he was scheduled to be on one flight. We in turn scheduled a limousine to meet him. He did not show, did not bother to cancel the limo, and then ultimately called up and said, I'll be on the next flight, and he didn't show on that, but did not bother to cancel until it became obvious he wasn't there. And finally, so we sent limos out on three different occasions, paying for them all. He also was not exactly the most conservative person with room service and, and those kind of things in that setting. So I think to an extent he abused the, his position. And then in subsequent conversations, at least on one occasion, he wrote to Dick McGurno, uh, reminding him that as a, um, as a board member, um, as Bob Callahan saying to McGurno, as a board member, I am your superior. And I would remind you that as such, I would expect to be treated the same by you as every other board member, uh, regardless of the setting. And then on one other occasion where uh, I was meeting with Callahan and Charlie Bryan, uh, along with the Human Resource Committee of the board, uh, was asked by Callahan to leave the room, or was uh, in on one occasion, uh, notwithstanding the fact that I was secretary of that committee, and on another occasion was it was demanded that I answer to him on an issue that he had raised. Uh, so, obviously, Charlie as an individual, and I think it's due to his particular personality makeup, was able to, to build absolute barriers between the different places. I can't think of any instance where he ever referred to his board membership. On the other hand, Callahan flaunted it. So it really, it, you know, if you're looking at that from a kind of a historical and, and philosophical perspective, the, the answer is it all depends on who's in the seat mm -hmm. and uh, as to what they, they, how they deal with it. And I, I suspect I haven't discussed this with Roland Becerra, who dealt most often with Callahan, but I would suspect that he was reminded on more than one occasion that Callahan was a board member. So it's a w Was there any, uh, ev any problem at all with the other two people that are on the board who also represent employees, the uh, pilots and the, uh, the non-contract uh, employees? No, not directly. They, uh, they maintained a much more aloof position did not get into the day-to-day -day labor activities. Um, did their stuff, you know, did whatever they did with their labor organizations behind the scenes. And, it, and truly, it was in one case uh, uh, representing the non-contract people, and on the other hand, representing the pilots, so the two were there. There were cases where Boggs would have private meetings uh, without informing either other members of the board or the chief executive officer of the company would hold private meetings with representatives from the non-contract group, which is in a way a little bit subversive, or could be, and, and um, Taylor has been known to meet with both non-contract people and pilots privately. Uh, the non-contract meetings on the part of Taylor, I think, were more open, but any difficulties uh, that would arise by virtue of having a Boggs and a Taylor on the board would have been more along the traditional lines. That is to say, uh, people, there would be the same difficulties experienced by any corporation who has, board, who has a board member or board members that are, um, are uh, against or are not in favor of or working counter to the current management. So uh, it took that form mm -hmm. 
more than the form of of using it as a bargaining chip. Never, you never saw it in that mm -hmm. form with them. Uh, even after the um, the sale of the company in uh, in February, there still was problem in, in finally getting an agreement with the uh, transport workers, the, the flight attendants. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that and subsequent lawsuits and those kind yeah, of problems? Yeah, the. Um, that's kind of an interesting thing because it, uh, at the time the the sale, the at the time the board decided to accept the Lorenzo offer, the flight attendants did not have an agreement. And it was kind of an interesting exercise. And again, this becomes one of those perspectives of people who were standing around the lobby watching it go on. In one on one hand and then talking to people that were at the bargaining table with the flight attendants on the other. Uh, Joe Leonard had become personally involved in, uh, in the flight attendant negotiations and had for the last at least two days been at the bargaining table personally. I was not. Um, and what we were pressing to do, of course, was to get an agreement uh, with the flight attendants and get an agreement with the pilots and get an agreement with the IAM. And it, became, it was obvious from the outset that there was no way the IAM was going to agree to any changes in their contract uh, short an agreement with the pilots and flight attendants. So obviously the, the sheer um, um, need in, uh, to accomplish that on a timely basis was, was driving that. So Joe was at the table with, uh, with the flight attendants and, and probably um, was very, very close to an agreement when he was called and told to come back to the office here. And on leaving, he told Roland that basically he was not authorized to go any further than uh, than they currently were at the table so the kind of the things that were that were left to be negotiated i think are you know if you look at it from a, a very um, simple attitude and, and point of view it was that we had gone far enough and that was that was the extent of our ability to to negotiate, that is to say, we weren't interested in adding one more thing or changing one more thing. You remember that uh, that we are we are at the time working under a very very strict set of work rules that had been imposed following the expiration of the 30-day countdown period. So, uh, from from a bargaining standpoint, I think our point of view was that that even though we were interested in negotiating a contract. There were certain things we weren't willing to do, nor was there a need to do. Um, one, we weren't on strike. Two, we had imposed very favorable work rules. And, and three, we thought we had offered uh, adequate settlement. So Joe returned to the um, Eastern Auditorium to participate in the board sessions. And um, Roland was left in charge of bargaining, but with the understanding that he wasn't to proceed any further than had already been agreed to. And um, an interesting thing then took place because uh, Callahan was also in the board meetings and would then come out and as he watched, the, the, then the play became not whether um, the play became, uh, at the board meeting, the ebb and flow of are we going to sell or are we not? And as Callahan tried to judge this, and he can deny it, but you know enough people watched it happen, is as he tried to judge where the board decisions were going, and this is to me is an absolute abuse of his, of his position on the board, he would come out and call the bargaining committee and the two extremes of his messages were hurry up and settle 
it looks like this is going to get sold and we don't want to be left out there without a contract or take your time I think you can go and ask for this this and this so he was really swinging at both ends of the arc and are operating at both ends of the arc and and um, and he simply got caught uh, at the wrong side at the wrong time and the decision was made to sell and as quickly as that was done the attorneys for Texas Air said if you do not have labor agreements you are to to uh, any labor agreements that have been fi have not been finalized and signed on any offers to settlement are to be withdrawn by the company so we said to both Callahan and and the bargaining committee uh, we don't have an agreement we haven't reached an agreement and and the offer is withdrawn um, subsequent to that then of course we had to to get back into bargaining and we did that, but not without meeting first with representatives of uh, Texas Air, uh, primarily in the in the form of Jerry Gittner, and um, and in, in in a couple occasions instances Frank Lorenzo. And they took a very um, a very tough position. That is to say, they weren't directing the activity. They knew they didn't have the right to direct the activity, but their their line of questioning always was: if you said, "I think if we do this to settle, uh, or if we do this, we can reach a settlement," and they're always their question was, "Well, why would you do that?" I mean, you really have very favorable work rules right now with the imposed contract. Why would you want to go that far? And with that kind of um, with this, with that kind of attitude, we went back to the bargaining table and, of course, looked at some of the things we had talked about before and were very, very reluctant to go any further indeed. And um, the, we were asked at the table, what has changed? Why has your attitude changed? And the answer was, we, we have a new owner. And I think a little bit of that was driven by the, the the bitterness of the fact that we had lost our company and were not uh, feeling too good about that. And and also, by vir some of it driven by virtue of the fact that they had had an opportunity to reach a settlement on a timely basis long before that and refused to do it and we really didn't care at that point whether it was uh, an amicable settlement or an acrimonious one. So uh, that kind of discussion uh, took place and of course always a reference being that th though we might have been interested in doing that the night of uh, in order to reach an agreement and in order to avoid the sale, you know, you couldn't step up to it. Now we need to review the thing. A very unfortunate thing happened then because I think that that theme would have held out and we would have settled maybe on a slightly different basis but uh, quickly. Um, one of the TWU representatives, one of the international representatives is a guy from Pan Am named Mike Bakula. And Mike had known Jerry Gittner, I think from Pan Am days. And he ran into Gittner in the uh, in the lobby and said, "What are you guys doing? I mean, why uh, has the company changed its attitude? Your influence is being felt. You know, the things that they'd agreed to before, they were now backing away from, and so on and so forth." And Gittner's reply was to say that, "Look, Eastern is an independent corporation." It conducts its own bargaining. It sets its own parameters, and they all operate independently. And you have to deal with them, not me. Um, therefore, creating, I think, in the minds of the union a dichotomy 
because their perception was that this company was getting tough because it now had, uh, and so any, because it now had, was owned by a, 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 a company that was reputed to be tough in dealing with labor, yeah. only to find that that company was saying, uh, not so. So we were, in a sense, had the worst of both worlds, had, had uh, been exposed. I mean, we, you know, not in the sense that we had, uh, we had done that without, without some sense of that's the direction the new owner wanted to go, but uh, the new owner was essentially saying, not me, it must mm -hmm. be someone else. So and they're, they're cr thereby creating a credibility problem on that issue and made it much more difficult to settle. Um, I'm not sure it changed the level of settlement all that much, but it just made it more difficult mm -hmm. to bring resolution to the to the dispute. The uh, the uh, mediation board, of course, was a, the, the Harry Bickford, the NMB representative, was very much involved, and has been has been our habit in the past. Was the guy who really shopped the settlement back and forth and finally reached accord. Uh, I think uh, I'm saying that the contract wasn't substantively different or substantially different, but um, I think in some cases it was because I think what we saw was somewhat the, the, an injection of, of Bigford's philosophy as to what a contract should look like into the whole process. So where there was a willingness earlier maybe to, uh, to keep a tougher set of work rules, that kind of got relaxed in the settlement process. Uh, Frank was very, very anxious to have agreements locked up with both the flight attendants and the pilots, and we were facing almost a self-imposed deadline in that respect. So um, it became very, very important that we we reach the agreement as quickly as possible, um, for fear that that uh, it might get settled in a different office. That mm -hmm. is to say, it might get carried to the chairman's office, and and we just didn't need that further confusion. So it, uh, uh, I think the. The reluctance of um, of the Texas Air people to to inject themselves f from a um, in an open way. I mean, it is just to step up to that. Uh, maybe are overreading their 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 will and their uh, um, uh, ability to to hold and and their resolve. And uh, the heavy reliance on a mediator who is a former flight attendant and who has his own opinion as to what flight attendant agreements ought to look like, and the self-imposed but not obvious, uh, the self-imposed pressure of a deadline that I don't think was really obvious to the, uh, to the flight attendants. I think they thought we were afraid of something else, afraid of a strike afraid of any kind of confrontation. And, and that was a possibility because Callahan was threatening to strike. So it was a combination of all those things that I think we, we probably settled a little higher than we needed to and were not able to retain some, some kind of key uh, uh, work rule changes, you know, for one, flight attendants lifting tickets at the head of the jetway as is done by other carriers and so on. So uh, you know that that's basically the way that agreement worked out. Of course, we came. Uh, we stayed with it. Roland primary stayed with it. Ended up with a handwritten copy of the principles of the agreement, of which were signed off by John Kerrigan, because as is not uncommon, um, Callahan had more important things to do. I don't know what the hell they were, but. He needed to be somewhere else other than there, so he let left it to John Kerrigan of the International to kind of clean up, do the cleanup work. Uh, we 
went and sat down with the mediator and said, okay, this is a, precisely what we understand the agreement to be, written hand in, by hand. He said, that's it. We then went and sat down with Kerrigan, or at least Roland Passero did, and sat down with John Kerrigan and said, John, this is our understanding of the agreement. This is how we characterize it, and he signed off on each of those issues. Uh, once that was done, then we started to reduce to writing in contract form. It became obvious that we had some disagreement on, on some 11 issues, and some of them they had a point on and we were able to resolve those. Others they didn't, but they were, uh, they came away from it. Silly things like uh, the termination clause of the agreement provides of the old agreement provides for retroactivity if the if the contract is not ratified and put in force by a certain period of time we would reach back and pay people since there was obviously no no pay change in this and retroactivity had no application yet the flight attendants insisted on having it in there with the belief that if it was ever taken out they would never be able to bargain for retroactivity in a future agreement I mean, it's just pure ignorance on their part, but uh, those are not the kind of things you argue about forever, so we left it in. That was one of the more minor ones. The, uh, one, of the, one of the other things we did was take out a reference to, uh, to DC-4s or what er Electras and aircraft that were no longer flying in one, in one clause. <laughs> Uh, and uh, they didn't think that should come out. Uh, so I guess if we ever fly a Super Connie again, you know, that'll apply. The, and that was the nature of some of those. We agreed to put that language back in. Uh, of course, the more extreme one was, was the dispute over who would qualify for the 6% uh, pay. Uh, that was the settlement that that it was an outgrowth of the lawsuit and it was in fact an agreed to settlement for the lawsuit. The, the flight attendants had sued us for a full 18 percent pay from the period January, actually February 1 of 85 through whatever period in 86 we were until this new contract came into effect. And that was before the judge had been argued, both sides had been argued and the judge was ready to render decision and in fact had agreed to seal the decision pending the outcome of our, of our discussions. They agreed uh, to settle for uh, 6% uh, without hearing the decision and then it became an issue of who got the 6%. The contract itself provided that only, that is the labor agreement, provided that only those who were on the active roles as of the ratification date of the contract received the 6%. The flight attendants argued that although it might have said that, they never intended it that way, intended it that way, and the fact is that they wanted everybody included and said so. And we said, no, we didn't intend to pay $150,000 legal fees either, but we agreed to do that, and we were going to live with that. And that became the big focal dispute, really. I think we, we sat down one night and, and really met by telephone with them. I mean, they were in their attorney's office and we sat in McGurno's office and, and discussed all of the areas of dispute and were able to find a way to settle all of them except that one. And several attempts uh, before the court and so on had failed. Uh, following that, Callahan well, it, when we first refused to, re to give in on that particular issue, uh, Callahan called and said, if you don't, do, tried to, to get us to do that. I offered to do some alternative things. I said we would pay for, we would pay for everyone who had worked during that period under the 18% um, under reduction because there were some people who had, were under B scale whose pay wasn't reduced but we would, we would uh, pay everyone based on their earnings for that period 
if he would withdraw the demand for $150,000 legal fees. He said, no, he couldn't do that. Um, I offered to go back and, uh, and pay retirees only um, if he, uh, I think at that time it was just to include retirees only. If it would settle everything else, he wouldn't do that either. So finally he said, well, if you don't, there's only one way to settle it. I want everybody paid. I want the lawyer paid and so on. And I said, we're just not going to do that. A typical Callahan confrontation. So he said, if you don't do that, I will uh, not count the ballots. And so, so I said, if you don't count the ballots, we'll either file an unfair labor practice charge or sue you in civil court, file a civil action. And uh, we did that. We, in fact, uh, uh, filed in the same court that was hearing this other dispute. And uh, I don't know if I've covered this before with you, Jerry, or not. But uh, in fact, went into court on Good Friday. And our case, we presented our case. It's kind of an interesting story, and I'm not sure McGurner likes to hear this told, but we walked into court and to Judge Spellman's courtroom, and we've been there many times. And the jury box is on the right side, and the judge is straight ahead. And of course, there's a table on the left and a table on the right. And um, we walked in and sat all of our books down on the left-hand side. And uh, Carmen Leone, who's a, an attorney for uh, uh, Dick, works for Dick, said, wait a minute, we're on the wrong side. We're not the defendants, we're the plaintiffs. We're supposed to sit over here. And I think it's a, probably the first time in a long time we've been plaintiffs in court. So. We had to relearn the procedure. <laughs> but at any rate, we, we presented the case, and, and uh, uh, the union attorney then, Alan Greenleaf, said, look, we want you to understand that this has nothing to do with this lawsuit, but we are, in fact, going to count the ballots, and we are not threatening to strike, and, and we will have a, and it has nothing to do with this, but we are going to do that all along. and. Uh, so, fine. We said, if that's the way it is, then we really don't have a dispute. And the judge said, well, that's fine, but just to be sure, I want you back in court on Monday to tell me what the count is. So they, uh, they did, in fact, count the ballots, came back simply to say that it had been ratified. As it turned out, other sources have told us it was ratified by over 90 percent. So uh, that's, that's that. But, but again, I think it was the first time been a long time that we haven't reacted to those kind of threats. Um, Frank Borman stayed out of that, which I think was helpful because he, uh, Frank has a great sense of equity and I think left alone he would say, look, we got screwed on the legal fees, that's separate from what's right on the, on the back pay issue or the 6% distribution issue and we ought to just cover everyone. Uh, you know, I have mixed feelings on that because the fact is that many, many contracts are negotiated where uh, retroactive or back pay or some kind of back payment issue is resolved and it is done so on the basis of everyone on the active roles at the time. Um, retirees, another issue, but uh, and it's not uncommon for them to be brought in but many, many labor, legitimate labor agreements are reached on that basis. So, I mean, it really isn't a, uh, as much an ethical issue as Frank might think it is. But that's basically where we ended up with the flight attendant agreement. We have now, we are, the resolution of all of the outstanding issues was that we could, that were many we just settled on a mutually acceptable basis. There were about four or five that we agreed to arbitrate as a bona fide contract dispute, and the judge maintained control of the six percent issue. We have now uh, we have now presented our side. The union has gone back and presented their side, and and we expect a decision. I th I think that the, that is the end of the hearing process. 
uh, one of the things that, that, that had been asked uh, by both parties, I guess, is that Bickford testify as to what his recollection of the settlement was. And the, the um, chairman of the board, Walter Wallace, refused to let that happen under the immunity provisions mm -hmm. of the law. So I think they'll try one more shot at getting him into the witness stand, and then I think that's essentially the end of the, of the hearing. At the same time all of that was going on with the, uh, with the flight attendants, um, beginning with the negotiations on that Sunday night in February, this, something similar was going on with the pilots because you, d you didn't have an agreement with them either. Well, we or had. We were in the process of making an agreement. Yeah. The, when we came out of, um, see, I think the pilots believed all along this was a, a giant bluff and that uh, no one in ever intended, and I don't know what they thought, that, that Frank uh, Lorenzo was, uh, was working in concert with Frank to, to run this bluff, which doesn't make sense at all. I don't know what they believe. But the fact is they thought that our, our, um, th th that the f they thought that our statement that we're either going to fix it, sell it, or bankrupt it, was uh, uh, was fiction beyond point one, and so that they uh, they really didn't believe that that we were uh, we meant what we said, and so they were still fooling around, and there was really a split. I understand in the in the uh, bargaining committee, the master executive council uh, of those who believed this was one big game and others who believed we were serious. They had essentially reached agreement and said so, but were not going to sign it until they could really see which way the wind was finally going to blow. When the sale, the decision to sell, and the acceptance of that offer to sell was made, again, the same, the same statement. I mean, it was made at the same time. It's but going back to it, the, the attorneys for the acquiring corporation said, if you don't have labor agreements, withdraw your proposals. So Joe and I, um, Joe came out to the lobby and said, go with me. He called, he called Shipner and Al at the hotel where they were negotiating with the pilots and said, do you have a signed agreement yet? And Bob said, no, but you don't understand the process. And it's, we have an agreement, but it, uh, it is now before the committee for approval. They tentatively approved it, um, but we don't have it signed yet. And Joe said, quote, unquote, Bob, I don't want any of your bullshit. Tell me if you have a signed agreement or if you don't. And if you don't, I want it withdrawn. With that, we got in the car, pickup truck actually, and drove over to the hotel and walked in, and the press was all over the place. I mean, it was a horrible scene. And walked in and said to Shipner, do you have a signed agreement? And he says, yes. And he said, well, then where is it? And he said, well, it's in there. I don't have it yet. And Schulte came out and said, well, it, we have an agreement. And he says, show me the signature. And Schulte said, we have an agreement. And Joe said, you don't have an agreement. I'm here to withdraw it. And we came and almost became a uh, uh, physical thing. Schulte ran at Joe, was literally going to throw it. Uh, he had a, a drink or a glass of uh, something, was going to throw it at him because a very, very emotional time for them as well. I think because Schulte was caught up in, Schulte knew how critical the situation was. So he came at Joe with a, with a drink. Joe didn't see him. His back was to him. And, uh, and Al stopped him. And we left then and came back here, having told the pilots that we were withdrawing whatever proposal we had on the table. Um, 
At that point in time, they were obviously totally frightened of the prospect of, of being acquired by Texas Air with no contract. You know, the one thing they had learned from the Continental experience was that you never go into that setting without a contract. Mm -hmm. And so we got back and Frank had a call and told, uh, in the meantime, uh, Gibson and Shipner return and told them to take the contract back over and get it signed, that it was a contract, that we had reached an agreement, and that it should be signed. And they took it back and signed off on it. Now, did, did he have any independent evidence other than what you had, that, that there was a contract? No. I, I'm sorry, did, did Borman have? Did, no, I think only his conversation with uh, um, his conversation with uh, with Shipner and the desire to have one. Okay. So it uh, it really was a a very very emotional and tough situation. Uh, people were in tears. It weren't normally given to tears. Joe uh, was absolutely crushed by it. I think he, his his attitude toward the pilot organization, uh, you know, it's not different than mine, is that he really doesn't hold them in great esteem as a as a labor organization or or as um, as individual members of that committee. Um, we had, up to that time, uh, had uh, our resignations had been demanded by that group as a as a senior management organization, had been singled out in teleconferences uh, uh, as um, as being the cause of the problems. Myself, Joe, Frank had uh, been told that we were going to be sued for everything we owned, every personal piece of property we owned, we would lose. So there was not a lot of love um, lost between the, the we as individuals. But Joe was very, very seriously shaken by the fact that we had, that their, that their indifference and, and he, he held, I held them just as responsible as Charlie Bryan, I mean, had they reached an agreement earlier, had they come to the party earlier, um, I think that Charlie would have been hard pressed to take this last minute stand. There wouldn't have been a last minute stand. I mean, there would have been much more order to the process. Would Charlie have, have finally come around? I don't know. But we sure would have had more time to work with it, and it wouldn't have been nearly as frantic. And of course, the pressure of time, uh, the compression of time, and the the emotion of the of the of the moment always uh, created for Charlie a, uh, an arena that that was easier for him to say no than yes. I mean, that's that's happened to us in the past. So uh, I think from from that standpoint, uh, all of those played into Charlie's hand as opposed to being playing out of it. So it uh, was a, probably one of the most emotionally um, draining things that I think I've ever seen Frank involved in, Joe certainly involved in. He, he personally held the pilots responsible for the loss of the company and the flight attendants as well as, as Charlie. And um, I think, quite frankly, Jerry, as a result, you know, one, labor relations in this co corporation have changed dramatically. For one, the pilots will never again enjoy the position that they have as a labor organization in this corporation, and the flight attendants are, you know, a contract at best away from disaster. And I think they recognize that too. I mean, if you're if you're doing forecasting, I would say that the pattern that's been set by everyone else shows that flight attendants can be replaced, uh, that other people can do the job that they are overpaid and that there are people out there willing to work for a thousand dollars a month 
twelve thousand dollars a year not and so therefore thirty seven thousand isn't necessary so I think that that the uh, uh, the the event took on uh, takes on a meaning and a um, an importance that goes beyond the fact that it was at that point in time Eastern Airlines a corporation of some 50 plus years of age 50 years as a separate uh, independent corporation became a subsidiary of another company there was really in a sense an upstart and I think I suspect one of the most surprised people in the world when that all took place was Frank Lorenzo that it actually happened but beyond that I mean the, the historical kind of significance of all that I think it was also a turning point and I don't I don't think the unions, the labor organizations, have yet realized what's happened to them. Charlie has, and I maybe the pilots do, but it doesn't take long for their arrogance to to take back over. But there will, the pilots will never again enjoy a relationship with this corporation. Okay, we're back on. You, why don't you just repeat that last part? Well, I, I'm just saying that I don't think the pilots will ever again enjoy the kind of relationship they have as a labor organization with this corporation as they have in the past. They no longer will have a champion uh, anywhere. They will have, they will be dealing with people who, although have the ability and the inclination to forgive and forget the personal kind of things, uh, are not going to be enamored with the fact that that they are pilots, and that we in fact are ground pounders, mm. and uh, so I think that that although the pilots have enjoyed, uh, as I said, uh, history will show that the pilots have enjoyed a very elite position. I think that's changed. I think that mm. will change, and it and it will be more, perhaps more revolutionary than we'd believe. I think the flight attendants, I think they both from what's happened with us, but the industry itself as well, have been exposed as a, as a very powerless labor organization and uh, where they've not been taken advantage of in the past or that, that particular uh, absence of power has not been taken advantage of in the past. Uh, the the um, the events at other at other carriers have led you to know, not just believe, but know that you can operate through a strike with the flight attendants, that you can attract replacements, and you can, in fact, uh, dramatically change an organization if not if not uh, destroy it. And that's not a, an objective. They destroy themselves in the process. Mm. Uh, the mechanics, I, I think, long term. That we will we will create a company that depends on long service, highly experienced pilots, that depends on long service, highly experienced mechanics. I think those become the two critical skills. I think ramp, the turnover in the ramp service organization isn't going to matter. I think that we will need to develop uh, reservation and counter agents that know what they're doing. Possibly the res area is a job that you can't really do eight hours a day because of the CRT. I mean, it just it's a, there's a fatigue factor there. Um, so I think that'll change over time. But I think basically we'll, we'll redesign the, the notion or rethink the notion that every job in the airline is a career. I don't think it's true. I think that some are and some aren't. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just the same as any business. And if you want to, well, I think it's going to be true in any business, that there will be people that come and go, and there will be passed through jobs. And if you want to go on to other more important jobs, you'll do so. Or if you're willing to work forever for $6 an hour or $7 an hour as a ramp service guy, then you'd be content to do that, too. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, so I think, again, that to, to wander around, but the fact is that that, that whole event, really, and, and the waves, it was like a, 
a, a, a pebble in a pond, so the waves are really now starting to flow out. The fact that, that we are owned by a holding company, uh, which is free to move assets around to points that are most uh, profitable, and to do that with relative ease, uh, is a significant change in this business. And the, uh, the companies that aren't, the other carriers that aren't similarly positioned, I think, are in trouble. Uh, just to touch on one point that we may have covered yesterday, but I want to, want to be sure, particularly in the light of your discussion of the ne negotiations in February, isn't it true there was almost an agreement reached with the pilots uh, in January in Washington? Yes, I think we were, um, you know, in, in trying to reflect on the dynamics of that bargaining, I think we were very, very close to an agreement there. Uh, I guess five people would give you five different opinions on that, but, but um, we got caught up. I think that bargaining took on a life of its own. And uh, so in that room, you had all the ingredients you needed to reach a collective bargaining agreement, with the exception of people who had the real authority to make a deal. Mm. And so if it had been, say, say that had been model bargaining or had been mock bargaining, I can tell you it would have resulted in a signature on a sheet of paper. There was nothing wrong with the contract. There was a there, it, it was truly a bargaining process. Uh, issues were dealt with, emotions flared and then receded and so on. I think what happened is that, that the people on the committee then called their, their uh, confidants and counterparts and so on on the on the MEC, and the answer is, you did what? Because uh, a marked change took place. So I think what happened is we were, you know, the closest parallel would be to say we were engaged in mock bargaining. And uh, when these guys suddenly woke up and, and said, we have no real authority, or we have to go back and explain this contract to someone, the whole thing fell apart. So if you were there and watched it happen, you would say, look, you know, I mean, everyone starts off with the assumption that the person representing the labor organization has the authority to make a deal and has established parameters and they can work within those and if they stay within those, then they can go back and say, yes, we have a contract. I don't think they, I don't think they possess that ability. I don't think they possess that authority. And even though the contract might have been one that was acceptable to them, it wasn't, it certainly wasn't acceptable to their to their peers, and uh, the minute any kind of discussion started, I think it all got pulled back. So, you know, the question is, did the company screw up by not getting a signature on a dotted line then? Uh, one, I don't think we could have gotten a signature, and two, I think at some point a new day has to, to dawn, and when that occurred, uh, it was going to all fall apart. Uh, I'd you know, having said all that, I'd be interested in seeing what other people's uh, opinion is, but I don't. I think we were dealing with someone who had no authority to settle, and we had the, the heavies of the of the organization. I mean, Duffy was there, and all of his staff. Uh, Randy Babbitt, who had, was an Eastern, he's an Eastern pilot, but but attached to the staff. He had the full bargaining committee. He had Schulte. He had everyone there that it took except the authority to settle. And I don't think they had it. And I think that in the final analysis, when that, when it became obvious to these guys that they were much further out than they dared be, they were pulled back. And as, you know, as might uh, be, you know, as, as is always expected, uh, when that happens, it's almost time to start all over again. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can, 
you can fine tune settlements, but you can't just come back to the table. The, the, the we broke, came back to the table, and the proposal they made was so much, uh, was so dramatically changed over the things they had agreed on the night before, it was unreal. We didn't let it get away. I, I'm convinced we didn't get let let it get away because of timing. We didn't let it get away because we didn't get their name on a on a piece of paper. We never would have had a meeting of the minds once once the the content of those discussions and the content of that potential settlement was exposed to the other members of the MEC. So you know I. The guys that do this much more professionally, I guess, would argue that if you could have got them to sign that night, you'd have had a deal. I don't think so. I think it would have fallen apart. The pilots are notorious for letting deals fall apart, mm. whether there's a signature on them or not. They still haven't signed this contract. They still have four issues to resolve, and they're big issues. They go to whether they get the increases automatically that the IAM gets which were clearly excluded from uh, from consideration. Uh, they want to change the health care plan, and, uh, which is just not on, and two or three other things. Mm. And we're just not going to do that. And I'll predict that come June 1, when the IAM 3% increase goes in, they'll sue us to get it. So I mean, the most agreements with the pilots are ephemeral or best, and uh, often reneged on. I, I think I said earlier, Jerry, I, I just have no confidence in their um, in their ethic at the bargaining table. And uh, you know we could talk a long, long time on why that is, but I mean not my lack of confidence, but I could talk a long, long time on how that how that developed over time. And uh, I guess there are a lot of theories, and maybe some people don't even believe that it's a problem. fact is, it's a problem. And when you can't, when people are saying one thing and meaning something else, when they were trying to gra gain in the draft what they couldn't gain in a discussion, uh, when they try to change intent in days subsequent to the, the deal, you just, at least where I was brought up, you don't, you're not confident, and you, you, you think no ethic exists. Do, do you think that uh, part of the difficulty with the pilots is that uh, they do have a lot of uh, turnover, a lot of uh, new faces showing up each time, and so there's not, uh, uh, and each one knows better than all others of the pilots. And so you have a just Monday morning quarterbacking uh, kind of gone wild. The, yeah, I think the, part, part, the problem with the pilots is that you have, you have, um, one is that, the, that they have no real parallel in collective bargaining. So you, you if you view the pilots, um, they're almost like uh, organizations that go out and bargain uh, to set the, the base, and then individually they try to go out and negotiate for themselves. So I think pilots don't view themselves as belonging to a labor union. They view themselves as belonging to an association who uh, is going to bargain collectively on their behalf as long as they each individually like the outcome. And it doesn't take many people with, uh, and especially independent, fairly independent people as they are, to upset the outcome. I mean, you have 27 members of MEC, and they've, they're fond of putting together their little coalitions and so on. So I think what it comes down to as the pilots is they're more, f they're more fond of the process than they are the product. <laughs> and uh, if, uh, because they've never really been held to the product. I mean, it is just a, uh, a constantly changing world with them. And, uh, and if, you, if you ever finally sign the thing, 
you know, then that has a finality to it. So what you do is keep fooling with it. Uh, one, of, one of the evidences of fooling with it is that I understand some effort. I listened to a tape out of New York from an MEC member up there just recently, a telephone tape mm -hmm. that uh, is talking about a Skip Copeland. Yes, a, a design to re uh, get another purchase or do, do a number of other things. So. Yeah. You see that just as evidence of uh, basically the same thing. Of, it's of never, nothing is ever settled. Nothing is right. ever settled. And, uh, I, you know, I have some ideas on how to reverse that, but uh, it, what it takes is a resolve to finally say, look, I don't know what you guys are bothering me for. The deal's done. I don't care if you ever sign it. It's done. And, you know, we'll, we're about to go to print, so if you want to have the last word on this thing, you better sit down and dot some I's and cross some T's, but you're not going to substitute these for maybes and wills for shalls and, and those kind of things. And, um, and just get on with it. Mm -hmm. But in a sense, Jerry, over time, we've been our own worst enemy in collective bargaining because we have, we have set our own deadlines, we have set our own hurdles. And they, you know, at times when deadlines and hurdles weren't necessary. I mean, when all that was called for is patience and indifference more than patience, just <laughs> total indifference. Yes. Uh, we weren't, there was, you know, when you're working at a wage level that's acceptable, there's, what's the compulsion to increase it? So you just leave it alone. But that's an anomaly that we have a difficult time dealing with. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to focus a little bit on your, uh, the overall responsibility you have for uh, the human resource function for a minute um, and, and ask you just some general questions like, ha has there been a, a big increase in, in turnover, grievances, and those kind of measures uh, that um, throughout all of this, what, what seems to me to be a lot of turmoil within the organization. Yeah. The grievance load is up. And, uh, in with all the organizations? With everyone but the pilots. And the pilots don't seem to be filing grievances. They, they generally, I think the, the nature of their grievances are, uh, they have to do with contract work rule violations. And, and those occur during periods when there's some question as to what what the appropriate work rule is. And so during interim periods more than anything else, you know, does document 10 zip set aside this or enforce it so you get those I think in general and Al can probably comment more on that. But as as an organization the number of grievances filed by pilots is down. The number of grievances filed in the flight attendant organization on the other hand is way up. And that is an outgrowth of the, of the period in which the imposed contract was in place. And also an outgrowth of the fact that we're being much tougher on discipline, disciplinary action mm. in that workforce than we have in the past. And uh, that because of high absenteeism and generally a reaction that says, I think it's the nature of flight attendants if if there's controversy, the best way to deal with it is stay home, and especially if you have a lot of sick pay coming. So you just get sick and call in sick and don't come to work. And in fact, those, those um, ab the absenteeism in that workforce just grew to heroic proportions uh, along the way. They were, you know, running 16, 17 percent, and it was just almost bringing us to our knees. But but so there was a lot of action taken against people who were chronic non-attenders and uh, those some 35 people have been fired and of course grievances have been filed on those uh, with the IAM I think we're starting to be a lot more demanding of the workforce also with respect to how you treat people who are just uh, negligent who run into airplanes with equipment and those kind of things. So where we might have done a one, a five day or a two week, you know, m in many cases we're firing people now, and so those are obviously resulting in some increase in the grievance load. 
but almost all the grievances are related to disciplinary action and not contract work rule violations per se. Uh, in the year 1984, we were able to, and even into 85, we dramatically decreased the number of grievances filed in the IAM group. We tried, and I think primarily, not that the problems, well, one, there were fewer problems, two, it was a more, the workforce became more positive and, and constructive instead of uh, looking for trouble. Mm -hmm. They looked for problems to solve, and uh, and I don't think there was a lot of disciplinary action being taken. The uh, that has started to creep back up again because we're just not talking to one another mm -hmm. a lot. We had uh, when I first came here, we instituted a policy of meeting twice a year uh, to discuss issues of of importance, and it would be the labor relations reps and the general chairman, and they would bring up whatever was on their mind, and we'd try to take minutes and, and write responses and, and uh, solve problems. And those seemed to be a, a safety valve for, mm -hmm. uh, for that group. We have not, as far as I know, in the last two and a half, three years, had a, well, two years anyhow, had a slowdown or a concerted activity of any kind with the IAM. Uh, to the extent that someone got together and, and told people to stay home, I guess the flight attendant absentee problem could be characterized as concerted activity. Certainly when 17 percent of the people decide not to come to work, that's, that's more than a blip. Mm -hmm. So the, the grievance activity, I think we could get the grievance activity back down if we wanted to. I'm not sure we really want to at this point. I mean. No, you know, I don't take that as an indication of anything right at this time. I think, I think generally speaking, our labor relations are fairly solid. Um, we still accomplish things from time to time, but, but uh, not our, and maybe a better way of saying is I think generally speaking our employee relations are fairly solid. Mm. I think the relationship between management and employees whether it's in the mechanic group with the, on the ramp with the agents or with the flight attendants or the pilots is, is fairly stable. Maybe a little less with the flight attendants they are still smarting over some things. Our relationship with the flight attendant union is, is, um, is not good. I mean, they, they, um, they remind me of a guy who's still writing checks thinking he's got money in the bank when he doesn't. So they're s still fairly arrogant about the whole mm -hmm. thing. And maybe that's style. Mm -hmm. but, uh, and the mood with the, with the mechanics is a really strange one because Charlie, as I said yesterday, it just really seems to be beaten down. I mean, I'll say that as a, either to take either pleasure or displeasure at it. I mean, it's just an observation. He, uh, I'm not sure. He's probably losing the support of his constituents. Uh, there may be people surfacing that will run against him and maybe with some, some uh, success. Um, he may get thrown out on his ear along with all of his general chairmen. It's hard to say. Good chance. I think there's a good possibility mm -hmm. that that takes place next spring. I mean, the election is next spring. The one thing we did is uh, one thing we bought with a three-year agreement that now seems to to pale um, is to have an election or to have a bargaining round that uh, anteceded an election. So he or yeah, so that whoever was going to bargain didn't have to do it with uh, didn't have to do it with the contract that is to say we weren't at, we wouldn't be at the table at the end of this year with with the incumbent bargaining and his political life depending on the outcome of that bargaining round it's the other way around okay right. uh, can you comment at all on the uh, on the organizing effort among the non-contract employees 
You see that in any way related to the rest of the instability yeah, in the I see. Or what? Uh, look, that c that effort's been going on for over a year. It has. Huh. And I think that uh, the IUE was dead in the water um, up until the time we made the decision to again reduce wages. Had the had the IEM come to the same party, I think that that would still be dead in the water. But I think what has happened is uh, is a perception um, that that management has somehow screwed up, hmm. that something's wrong with this company, something's wrong with the way it's being managed, that we consistently, as employees, I mean, paraphrasing, but that as employees we must consistently take pay cuts and do all those things. The truth is that, that employees are still making more today than they did five years ago, ten years ago, obviously. There's been a steady increase because with the givebacks have been countervailing uh, improvements. Mm -hmm. So they really haven't. It's not a case of my standard of living is 20% lower than it was three years ago. I mean, I'm still relatively the same. But uh, all that aside, I think the the zeal for the campaign, the, the, the thing that gives it any fire at all, is the fact that, that it's... You know, I would say that the votes being cast are anti-management votes, not necessarily pro-IUE votes. Right. There really is a, a union that has almost nothing to offer uh, our employees, mm -hmm. and our employees realize that. But they're madder in hell. You know, as the line goes from network, they're madder in hell and they're not going to take it anymore. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think a big, a big help has been the fact that we, the officers have been visiting these uh, these various uh, locations, so you know, and I think we'll cover all of the stations and all of the red centers before the, the ballots actually go out. The ballots will get sent out tomorrow. Will oh. be mailed tomorrow. So uh, um, it'd be an interesting thing because I can tell you, uh, the general feeling was we had that we had that election lost um, two or three weeks ago. So it'll be interesting to see how it, mm -hmm. how it comes out. You know, one of the things that I've been struck with at Eastern is um, is the complexity of the pay plans you have, and some of which you mm -hmm. know began began in the yeah. late '70s to uh, to try to uh, draw the employees more into the company, and for the various reasons, uh, just horrendously complicated. Uh, that must be more, way more complicated than anything you confronted at uh, with the rubber company, for instance. Oh, yeah. Isn't it? Um, employee compensation plans, employee benefit plans, ought to religiously follow the KISS theory. You know, that's it. Keep it simple, stupid. Because uh, people, as bright as they are, and I think we have probably one of the brighter workforces in the world. Uh, really don't want to have to constantly go to a book to figure out how they get paid and what their compensation plan is. So I agree with you. We have needlessly um, we have needlessly constructed the pay schemes. We we have needlessly complicated our our pay schemes and and the give back schemes and the all of this kind of stuff. I tell you, if you could walk to a blackboard and wipe the slate clean, and could do so with the confidence that you could redesign something that made sense, I think one you wouldn't have, you know, the multitude of pay levels we have. Seems to me your clerical workforce would either be a one, two, or three, and you know, and in that you could surely find a place for every clerical employee in the company. Um, the same way with your agent group, it's 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 perpetuating a fiction, in a sense, to keep to have all of the pay scales because I think all you're really doing in the process is um, is dealing is saying to longer service employees, yeah, this really isn't a career, but we're just going to keep paying you more money anyhow. 
and the longer service employees say, you know, I don't care whether it's a career or not, as long as you keep paying me more money. Right, right. So, you know, it's, it's like the flight attendants. Nothing's more ludicrous than having a 13-year pay scale. Uh, you know, there's no way to reason to that. So, uh, but uh, you, you know how it got there. And that's at some point in time, you know, when we decided that people were going to stick around on that job. You had a negotiating committee made up of people with five years, and they said, what we really need is an additional pay increment called six years. And he said, how many people is that? And he said, well, you know, it's the five people sitting here. Well, hell, if that'll make a deal, let's do it. Next year, you know, a couple hundred entered that, <laughs> and we just stepped our way up to 13 years. Yeah. Always uh, with the foresight of about a foot of distance. So I think, yes, I, the, the pay scheme is complicated, is needlessly so, uh, is the invention of wage and salary administrators more than anything, and just really too much. Uh, uh, one of the things that I think is unique about the airline is the, uh, is the whole problem of communications, with people spread all over the place, and constantly moving, and living where they don't work and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, probably easiest with the machinist than it is with anybody else, even though they are spread around as well. It's easy with the machinist uh, really for two reasons. Uh, one, they, they tend to stay in one place and go home to a house every night as opposed to a hotel and a house every third night. And uh, secondly, they have a very, very tight organization and, and very tight structure hmm. and very formal structure. So you can really, if you want to communicate with a machinist, you can either, you can create kind of a, of a shadow system that replicates theirs or you can use theirs. And, and they, are, they know that when a bulletin comes out that says C.E. Bryan, you know, it's, it's something you read. And so Charlie doesn't have to invent communication system. He just simply says to his secretary, I want to get out a bulletin. Everybody knows what that means. Mm -hmm. It means he writes it, signs it, and it goes to a printer and gets distributed, and it's the same channel day in and day out, every time. And we can, can essentially do the same thing with them. With the other work groups, it's it's with the non-ground and the and the, the crews. It's very very difficult, and uh, they don't stay at work except for the time that they have to be here. So they're, you know, as they say, out of here when uh, when the work day ends. Mm -hmm. And so it's a it's a different pattern. The, they live different places than they work, you know. One was someone was telling me about a flight attendant who commutes from Australia, of all places. I mean, you can <laughs> that. hard to believe. It? Well, you yeah. you just about can't go any further away <laughs> That's right. without coming back the other way. <laughs> That's right. Um, one thing that I was um, surprised by, and maybe I shouldn't have been because I don't know other airlines, but. Finding the employee communication function in corporate communications rather than human resource or industrial relations was sort of a surprise to me. Is that is that an inconvenient or a problem or no? It really isn't. Uh, the, the the real the real problem was uh, was developing an employee communications department at all. Prior to um, prior to uh, uh, say 1983, uh, when McGraw came here, we viewed communications as external. So most of the stuff was PR. Huh. And I don't know, uh, you know, I guess uh, I don't know that many corporations, but, you know, f f uh, because of friendships, I know how some of them function. I know that employee communications at Ford. I don't believe is a is a human resource function. I think it's a separate function of its own because certainly employee communication covers a, a multitude of subjects 
not all of which have to do with the employees, the employee relations kind of thing, issues. Mm -hmm. uh, but the big change here, and it's one that's it's continuing, was, was to develop an employee communication or develop a communications organization that was employee communications as well as public or PR. Mm -hmm. And I think Cosley's uh, strong point it was McGraw's as well, and that was what he was essentially here to do, is brought in to convert that group from people who only worried about talking to the public through the media to people who also worried about talking to employees and building some credibility. So that's taking place, and, and uh, Jerry uh, Cosley continues that. I think his focus is inward as opposed to outward, although he does both well. But I, I don't find that all that strange. Hmm. Um, maybe a final thing here is the, um, in any job you, uh, you kind of deal with the uh, with the virtues of your predecessors and their, and their, uh, and I mean the whole organization, not just your immediate, yeah. um, a, as well as their, uh, their failures. Yeah. And uh, two things have been quoted to me uh, by a number of people was a remark made by, should have made a note of his name, it slips my mind now, the fellow who is now president of Piedmont. Bill oh, Howard. Howard, yes. And uh, you talked to him? No, I have not. Oh, okay. And uh, and and Amos, who I've not talked to either, but uh, one or the other of them is credited with saying, at one point, one of them wrote a memo that said, "Here's the strategy we ought to engage in. We ought to play like we're poor and get a deal with the unions." And it, that apparently that may, became public. And the other statement by one or the other of them was that uh, the whole thing was a fake anyway. You know, we, we, ne we weren't in that bad a shape financially. We were just faking it. To have, have problems like that um, made your job a great deal more difficult? Yeah, I guess if you, if you, um, if you dwelled on it. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard that Bill Howard, it was Bill Howard who allegedly wrote a memo that said, you know, we should always try to negotiate during the downside of the cycle because we can settle better than, uh, you know, th one, if that's, if that's true, uh, negotiating during periods of hard times to get a better settlement is, uh, is so shallow and uh, on the face of it, that I wouldn't know why, to, you know, why the hell you'd even make it the subject of a memo. I mean, that's like discovering that the sun rises, obviously, <laughs> yeah. uh, when times are tough. I mean, if they're truly that, and not just a minor t downturn in the... So if you're bargaining when times are in total tough, you're going to reach better settlements than if you were bargaining during prosperous times. And secondly, if, if, if it's the nature of the industry to cycle, then, you know, people are just going to say, you're full of shit, Howard. I mean, we'll just sit here and look at you. It's not uncommon for, a, uh, for, it to, uh, for us to take, for this industry to take 18 months to negotiate a new contract. How many, time, how many cycles can you go through? I mean, you just, hell, the stupid part about that is you just wait out the cycle. Mm -hmm. So I haven't really, I mean, that, that just defies comment, I mean, yeah. uh, beyond that. So I didn't really thought about that much. And I, uh, the other one is that uh, it's all, you know, I, I really don't know how anyone could make that statement if Marvin made the this, this statement that it was all a big ruse. It goes back, I think, uh, to the, to the uh, orientation to a uh, to a, a regulated orientation, and that is to say, no matter how bad you are, you will always come out of it because you just simply transfer the cost to the flying public. And um, and I own that piece of the business. You see what what regulation um, changed or deregulation changed um, in my point of view, is it really destroyed the most valuable asset the uh, airline had, 
and that's exclusive rights to routes. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, you know, literally the value of the airline plunged overnight. And if I, if I have a monopoly on a piece of the country, then, then um, my, uh, you know, my income can pretty well be controlled. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, or at least uh, my indifference to cost can be almost un unbridled. <laughs> I think, it, yeah. you know, I don't think we ever made any money, but it didn't really matter somehow. So profit was, you know, we have people saying, I don't believe this company even wants to make a profit. Well, at one time I believe they were right. You know, not in, uh, I mean, I, I can't possibly share Frank's frustration of 15 or 16 years of trying to figure out a way out of this mess. And I think sometimes, in fact, I, I believe that today, we exist today because of Frank Borman's sheer will in many, many cases. And I think anyone who has a job here today owes it to Frank at some point in time, you know. And we suffer terribly from the what have you done lately syndrome. But, um, I, you know, a long, long answer, I don't think I've really been tainted. I don't think I've been bothered by that those reputations all that much. You just simply say, you know, that's interesting, but only that, hmm. and uh, go on. You know, over time you develop your own reputation. It's a For good or ill. So yeah, that's right. <laughs> and that's the one you have to live with. Yeah, that's, final that's the one you really have to live with. Yeah. 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 yeah, but some of those, uh, look, uh, Jerry, this this, I think we've run a giant commune for a long, long time, and where everybody got their share first, and if there was any crop left to sell to someone else, then you did it, but it didn't real that really wasn't the mission. You know, it was just a function for your own welfare. And we did it well. Yeah. People have done very, very well. Uh, it's a glamour business. But now it's changed, yeah. and, oh, yeah, yeah. and getting used to the change is hard for yeah. people That's who've right. been here for That's a long right. time. Very, very difficult. It's almost unfair. I mean, it's all, you know, look, look, I've got to, if I sat and looked at a bargaining strategy or, or just a way we ought to view this industry, not necessarily even a bargaining strategy, I can, I can easily reason to the point that mechanics are pretty close to where they ought to be. I mean, that is to say, if someone else will pay them more, I'm going to lose them, therefore I'm going to have to respond to the market. And I, you know, if you just look at comparable worth, say, not as a male-female issue, but comparable worth to say, what is a mechanic worth uh, who has a license to repair airplanes and has the skill and ability to do that versus someone else, you know, versus a guy who assembles autos or a guy who does other things. I think you can, you can pretty well reason to their pay structure. And, um, so, you know, that, that is not a big deal, but uh, if you look at, use that same test for a ramp service person, you're going to quickly realize that uh, they're probably overpaid by a, by a factor of two. You know, so they're probably making twice as much as they ought to make. And you could probably go out and replace them all day with about a two-week training program for six dollars an hour instead of twelve. So you, you 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 put that in focus and you say, well what do you do about it? Well, unfortunately we're the victim we're the victim of that fourteen, twelve to fourteen dollars an hour far beyond the fact that we just have to pay it. And that is when we did when we hired, it was not uncommon to we said, look, we're gonna pay that kind of money, we want the best. So, you know, we have our fair share of college graduates with teaching degrees tossing bags around. Why? Because, you know, it's a lot more, you know, $12 to $14 an hour is a lot more than $55 a day, which is what a teacher makes. So once they're there, they say, well, I'll do this for a while, and then I'll go to teaching. Well, they get in the same trap. So. Then now, now that you've created that, I mean, you've literally, and, and I don't know the answer to this, I, you know, I need some help to find my way through it, because what you really have done is created a, a workforce 
that is educated and right when they don't have to be. Now you want, you, you have paid people what they are worth, and now you want to change the game to pay them what the job is worth. Okay. And, yes. and so the guy, the ramp service man in Boston, who owns a nice home with a swimming pool and is sending his kids to some good school, has all of a sudden s said, Leo, you've got to learn to get along on half. Well, now how, now how do you get to there? Mm -hmm. And uh, merging B scales won't do it. So, uh, you know, there's some ideas, but it's a, it, it is a big social problem. And uh, it goes beyond collective bargaining and cost cutting and those kind of things. So if you, if you settle, it, it you need to dramatically change the way people are paid and the way people view their jobs and those jobs that are careers and those that are not in this industry. If you're going to make it, you have to reorder things. And that is going to be a difficult process. And if you simply, you see, I think the model for doing that is the flight attendant contract. And the flight attendant contract says, look, you folks are frozen for three years at a pay that is 20% under what your book used to say. And not only that, you have a new workforce coming on that starts at this level, starts at $1,000 a month, and works their way up to 1250 after five years, and that's it. And we literally aren't interested in changing that five-year thing. Does it merge? No. So what we, we've got this parallel course we're going on. And I think that that, you know, if, if you could model one, if I could do it right now, it would be that. And then say, is there enough money to finance the passage of time? But uh, and the pilots is that way somewhat, but, but not totally. You know, just to, just to give you an example of our, of our resolve to do that, the pilots, we could have easily settled for a B scale that merged on a slope after five years. And we settled for one that merged all at once after five years. And so you guys gotta be crazy. You're gonna go along paying at this level and all of a sudden it jumps up, you know, X thousand dollars a month. I mean, it's that kind of leap. Okay, we're back on. You were just reflecting a little bit on how that same transition might take place with the pilots. Well, it said that, the, 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 uh, the, to repeat, the pilots were perfectly willing to negotiate a, a, a B scale that merged after a, a five-year period. So it did so on a slope that, that converged with the present A scale after five years. And pr uh, from a philosophy standpoint, we're unwilling to do that, even to the extent that we're willing to go along and allow the, the uh, two scales to merge in one giant leap, knowing that that was five years out and again, that between now and five years from now, we were going to negotiate another contract and we would, we would absolutely have the resolve to continue those two pay scales on a parallel course instead of a converging course. And again, I think, you know, with the pilots as well as the flight attendants and with the rest of the workforce, I think it's just a matter of having the time to watch this workforce shift from the A to the B, literally. It's kind of funny, the flight attendants have always argued that, that it was just totally unfair to have people working in their different pay rates. And that how do I how do I expect to have the camaraderie in the uh, in the cabin when everybody was when I had A scale and B scale people, and the fact is I used to have standing offer that if you can find me two people that are working for the same rate in a cabin under either A or B, you know I'll buy your argument. But with a 13 year progression, <laughs> no one worked for the same pay anyhow. Yeah, you see. And so then what they were really saying, I guess, is that I'm under one scale and you're under another scale. But it was the whole, that, you know, characterized, the whole idea was characterized as two, two people doing the same job for different pay. It's always been that way. So. 
Oh, interesting times, interesting times. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, the, the real issue, I think, is going to come down to can you do this uh, without confrontation, or does it take confrontation? And now, yet another interesting wrinkle, because um, we have a workforce that seems to be firmly entrenched in no change, the IM. And we have another workforce uh, that's primarily made up of the non-contract people, but I think some observers as pilots and flight attendants who are watching this, who have negotiated lower pays, pay scales. And I'm not sure that workforce, from a morale standpoint, will tolerate a peaceful settlement with the IEM. And that's kind of a crazy thing to face. But what they're saying is, I don't want, you know, I don't want my pay increase. What I want is revenge with oh. the work group. And how does that happen? So I think we may very well be on a course with the rest of our employees that we could absolutely stand up and say, folks, the IM has just signed an agreement uh, that takes a 25% pay cut that provides a $6 an hour rate for ramp service people forever, and they've signed it and ratified it, and we were able to do it without confrontation, and they would say, boo. I mean, they would say, no, if you had to kick their butt, we wanted to see their butts kick. I really think that and it's going to become, if we're not careful, the game will become confrontation and not level of settlement. That's Isn't that interesting? Yeah. In, now, now, does that come primarily from that spring when... Uh, I think it goes back. It has its genesis in the spring and then in February of this year with that group not coming, okay. with and the people saying, look, we'll tolerate their not being there, but you better get it when the time comes. Okay. Okay. And what get it means is is uh, is shutting them down. Yeah. Humiliate them. Yeah. Put, put yeah. It, down it goes somewhere. beyond. I mean, uh, and I'm saying that that we are if we're not careful, and I'm not I'm not making a judgment at this point, but I'm just saying we're not careful to the extent we don't want this to happen. It's going to happen purely because it has to as a catharsis. Interesting. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks much. Okay. Jack, I really appreciate your time and your comments.